Algebra 2 EOC review, rational statistics and reading a table. So you're going to need your notes packet and the Algebra 2 EOC pretest. So let's start talking about rationals. So what you want to do if you are dividing rationals is to first factor the denominators if you can. Then Keep the first term as it is, change the division to multiplication, and flip the second term. Because when you divide by a rational or a fraction, it's like multiplying by the reciprocal. So if we look at number 8, go to, in your pretest to number 8. We're going to divide and then simplify. Now, before we divide, first we're going to factor. So if you look at the numerator of the expression on the left, it will factor as x plus 1 times x minus 1. The denominator will factor as x plus 1 squared. And then we'll change the division to multiplication, and then we will flip the fraction. So on top we have x plus 1, and on the bottom we have x minus 1. Now we could start dividing out any numerator with any denominator, but look at the denominator on the right, 1 minus x. Well. On the numerator on the left, I have an x minus 1. So here's a technique that I can do to get these terms to be the same. I'm going to divide out all the x plus 1s, and I have left an x minus 1 over 1 minus x. So in my denominator, I can factor out a negative 1. It's just something that I can do, and I'm left with negative 1 plus x, which is the same thing as x minus 1. I'll put the negative to the front and then those expressions will divide out. So my final simplified answer is simply negative 1. So look at number 20. And let's see if I can get my video to cooperate. So we've got, in your pretest, turn to number 20. <clears throat> We're going to divide. So it says, perform the given operation, draw lines from the algebraic expressions to form the simplified rational expression. So the numerator and the denominator. So I'll start with my numerator on the left, and I'm going to take that and factor it. It's four terms, so I'm going to factor by grouping. <clears throat> it will factor as x plus 2 times x, minus nine, or x squared minus 9. My x squared minus 9 expression will factor further. So now my expression on the left, the numerator, is all those three terms. In my denominator, that's a difference of squares, so it'll factor as x plus 2 times x minus 2. <clears throat> I'll change division and multiplication, and then flip that second rational, x minus 2, and then as I do that, I will factor the numerator, which is now the denominator. Now I can divide out any term in the numerator with any term in the denominator. So my x plus 2's divide out, my x plus 3's divide out, and my x minus 2's. So I'm left with x plus 3 over x. And then I'll just match those for my numerator and my denominator. So now go to number 25 in your pretest packet. <clears throat> We need to solve this. What is the solution for this equation? So if you look down at the bottom of my screen, it says first we're going to factor the denominators and then use that to find a least common denominator and solve. So on the left, I can factor my denominator as x times x minus 1. And now my common denominator will be x and x minus 1. I don't have to adjust the numerator on the left, but on the right, I need to multiply by x. So now I can just set those numerators equal to each other. I do check and make sure that if I plug in my answer, I won't get 0 in my denominator. And I don't. It works. So x equals 2. We always want to make sure we check with rationals. Now turn to number 30 in your pretest packet. We need to determine the least common multiple for these polynomials. So it's like a least common denominator. That's the same thing. So the first thing is I'm going to divide them into their multiples. I'm going to factor. So I have a trinomial. I'm looking for two numbers that will multiply to give me 6 and add to give me 7. So it factors as x plus 1 times 
x plus 6. Now my second term is a difference of squares. We've seen it before, and that's how it factors. My third one is a trinomial with an a value other than 1. So I have to factor by grouping. So when I factor that, I end up getting x plus 6 times 2x minus 3. Now I have all my terms written in their factored form. So to find the least common multiple, I need a term from each of them. So from the first term, I need x plus 1 and x plus 6. From second, my second term, I already have an x plus 1, so now I need to just add an x minus 1. And then the third polynomial in its factored form, I already have an x plus 6, but I need to add 2x minus 3. So my answers will be a, c, d, and e. I need each of those for a common multiple. All right, now let's talk about statistics, a survey method. So there are many different ways um, to sample a population, just a group of people or something that you want to find out some information about. A random sample is the most reliable. That's where every member um, has an equal chance of being selected. If you have a misrepresentation, that's called a bias. So an unbiased sample equally represents all parts of the population, but a biased sample under or over represents. A random sample um, gives the best chance of having an unbiased, unbiased results. So look at number two in your pretest. The student council at a high school places a box in the cafeteria where students could vote for three specialty lunch days to see which would be more popular. Placing a box means that it is a self-selected um, <clears throat> survey. So it's not random. So we're not gonna have the most reliable results. And you can see those results that more than twice as many students voted for Mac and Cheese Monday than the second place Taco Tuesday. Now, at her own table, Chelsea asked the students um, which choice they voted for. All but one said they voted for Taco Tuesday, and the other one voted for Fish Friday. So what's the most likely reason for the difference between the student council's results and Chelsea's? Well, Chelsea's did a survey that it also could be biased because she was asking and the people could feel influenced by her. It wasn't random either because it was people at her table. So it looks like both surveys were biased and a difference between the results would be understandable. For B, it says both the student council and Chelsea collected unbiased, and that's not true, and they weren't random samples. In C, student council's me method was biased, yes, but Chelsea's method was unbiased. No, that's not true because Chelsea probably had some influence. And then D, Chelsea influenced the students, most likely. Um, and the student council's box was taken over by people that really like mac and cheese. Well, perhaps, but we don't know for sure. So most likely, what happened is just simply A. There was a bias in both methods, and so there was a difference in the results. Another thing that we have in statistics is a normal distribution. So sometimes data will fall into a normally distributed um, configuration. And if you look at this, in the middle, that number would be the mean. And then <clears throat> that's where most of the data will fall. And so that's where the curve is the highest. And then as we move away from the mean, we have what's called a standard de deviation. So each mark is one step either in the positive or negative direction from the mean. And then you can see what percent of the population is gonna fall that distance from the average. We have 34 and 34, and then so on and so forth. So the further that you get away from the average, the less percent of the population of you know, whatever is being studied um, occurs. So look at number 13 in your pretest. A total of 150 students took an Algebra 2 exam. The scores are normally distributed, so that means most of the people scored around the average, um, and the average was a 71. A standard deviation is the average distance from the average, which was 
So if we put this on the bell curve, then that means that 71 is in the middle, and then one step away would be a score of 77 in the positive direction, and one step away in the negative direction is 65. So how many students would you expect? Well, since this is normally distributed, that means that a total of 68% of the people will score close to the average, either one step standard deviation above or below. So here's an extra problem, and go to this in your notes packet. So at present, there are 450 NBA players. The mean or average height of these players is 6'7". Wow. And the height is normally distributed. Um, what is the approximate number of players whose height would be within one standard deviation? So that means that middle mark is 6'7", and 3.5 inches in one direction and 3.5 inches in the other. So that would be a total of 68%. Since we were given the number of players, we can simply find 68% of that total, which would be 306 players. Those people are tall. All right, now look at number 21 in your pretest. So <clears throat> we're gonna focus on measures of center, so mean, median, and mode, and also standard deviation, which is the average distance from the average. So a random sample of 11th grade students from two high schools took a math test. The table um, below shows or displays each school's results. A score of 35 indicates that the student is college ready. So we need to look and see which statements could be more than one are supported by the results. So at least half the students at both schools scored as college ready. Well, we're gonna look at the middle score and see where it compares to 35. So Armenian scores are 37 and 35.5. So that means yes, um, since the middle score is above that target number of 35, at least half of them at both schools did. So that would be true. Now for B, it says the data from both schools do not appear to be skewed because the mean and median scores for both are close, and that is also true if you look at those. C says school A does a better job instructing its students because the median score A is higher than it is at B. Well, just because the median is higher doesn't mean that overall, and we can't really determine causation, so that one we can't say necessarily supported by the results. For D, it says the difference between the mean scores at the two school is not sufficient. And if you look at those, then that is also true. And let's get back to that problem. All right. And then finally, and I am not sure, I'm having just a little technical difficulties, but it says... So D would be true, and then since the standard deviation of the scores is less than the standard deviation of the scores in school A, we, school B does a better job. Again, we can't really determine causation, so that one will not be true. So A, B, and D. Go back, or at least we were on our note sheet, so let's talk about reliable data sets. <clears throat> so there are different ways that data can be taken from a population. You can have a self-selected sample, like that box in the lunchroom. You can have a systematic sample, so you have some kind of rule every fifth person. Um, you can have a stratified sample, where the population is divided into smaller groups, and then um, you randomly select, like at a school, if you population is divided by age group, so freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and then you randomly select 50 from each of those. You can have a cluster sample where if you divided like freshman, sophomore, junior, seniors, and then you would just survey one cluster like the juniors. And then a convenience sample. So if you're just standing outside the school and you are surveying, um, then you just talk to the people that walk by. So what um, is convenient for you. So go to 24 in your pretest. We've got three high school students who are trying to determine what portion of households in their community recycle. 
Student A surveyed 25 of his family member and closest friends. That's pretty convenient. So that is not random. Random's gonna be the best. Student B divided the community into five equivalent sections and then randomly selected five. So that's a stratified um, survey and that is random. And then C surveyed the first 25 people. So that is also convenient and not random. So student B has the most reliable data set or the most chances for that because that student collected data from a random sample. Again, a random sample will be um, the one that will most likely give you the most um, accurate results. Now let's talk about margin of error. Because whenever you sample a population, you will never get the exact results, um, but you will get close. And so margin of error, there's a formula uh, that has been determined. If you take the sample size, so the number, the size of the group that's being, let's say, surveyed, and you take one and divide by the square root of that sample size, that will give you a decimal. And that decimal translates into a percentage um, above and below probably the, the actual percentage. So it gives you an interval that can um, the results will be contained in. So if you look at example four, a survey of 2,048 people in the U.S. said 55% said that television is their main source of news. So to find the margin of error, we take one and divide it by the square root of that sample size, square root of 2,048. That gives us plus or minus um, about two hundredths. And so as a percent, move that decimal two places to the right. So that's 2.2%. You're going to add that onto your survey results and subtract it. So when we do that, we get an interval of 52.8% up to 57.2. So that interval probably contains the actual percent of people. 55 is an estimate, and that margin of error gives us an interval. Look at 27 on your pretest. So a city council is trying to pass a new proposition to increase funding for local schools. In order to pass that, they'll need over 50% of the votes in the upcoming election. So a poll of the random sample of 600 resident voters was conducted and 52% of those residents support the new budget. The margin of error in the poll is plus or minus 4%. Should the city council um, strongly believe that the new budget will be approved? So as you can see with that 52% found out from the survey, when we add and subtract the margin of error, that gives us an interval, or it's called a confidence interval, of 48 to 56%. So no, we, the city council would not, should not strongly believe that the new budget will be approved because that interval includes values that are less than 50%. All right, read through this extra problem and then <clears throat> It says the concentration of the H positive hydrogen ion in a solution is 0 0.000038. So the solution is, and we have to find that on the table to determine if it's acidic or basic and its pH level. So if we look at our table, this number is bigger than one ten thousandths, but smaller than one thousandths. So that means that it is between three and four and is acidic. All right, that concludes our EOC review for statistics and our first topic that I just can't remember. Um,